God cares for you, my friend. You can cast all of your care upon him because he cares for you. You know, the psalmist said this, that our help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. That's a lot of help. You've got a lot of help, don't you? So let's pray right now and let's just appropriate every bit of that benefit from God himself. Precious Lord, we need your help. We need your help even as we turn to the word of God. We ask that you would just breathe this word into our hearts. And Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Help us, Holy Spirit. Help us to be able to understand the words of our Father, the the gold of our Father, to be able to unfold the wisdom so that it becomes applicable in our lives. Help us, Lord. Help us. We ask for your help, and you're so gracious and kind and merciful to give us help as your family, as sons and daughters of the Most High God, all in Jesus' name. Amen. Doesn't it feel good just to let go of all your cares and worries and just trust them into the hands of God who made the heavens and the earth? Oh, it's so good to be able to give your problems to somebody reliable, isn't it? That's so good. We are continuing our series called True Grit. Oh, True Grit. Yeah, we're talking about True Grit in part one. We really just dialed it in on how that True Grit, you never give up. You just, you don't give up on you. You don't give up on God. You don't give up on his good plans. And I love the scripture verse that we really dialed in on was Galatians 6 and 9 saying this, and let us not lose heart and grow weary and faint in acting nobly and doing right for in due time and at the appointed season, we shall reap if... That's a big if, if we do not loosen and relax our courage and faint. And we just said, you know, it doesn't say if we're talented enough or if we're strong enough or if we're tall enough or if we're old enough or mature enough or young enough. It doesn't say any of that. It says if we don't let go, if we don't let go. And so I just want to dial in today talking about true grit on hold on. You got to hold on. Right? How many songs have told us to hold on, hold on to love, hold on to this and hold on to that? Well, God's telling us to hold on to our faith in Him and His promises and His goodness. So true grit really means hold on. Use your faith to hold on. That verse that we read is so beautiful because it says that you've got to learn to hold on and have some grit. You know, if you want a picture of true grit, it really isn't the Hollywood cowboy that's smoking unfiltered cigarettes, digs a bullet out of his own leg around the campfire, chases outlaws for fun and with a jug of whiskey at his side. I mean, you know, we use that title True Grit to kind of, it kind of conjures up that John Wayne with a patch over his eye, but that's not really True Grit. That's not biblical True Grit. That won't take you from this life to the next life. Do you want a picture of what really is True Grit? The Hebrew word for mother is the word M. And the word picture tells us that a mother is an unfailing supply of water. She is a life giver. She is strong, strong water in the desert, making an oasis of life. Now that, my friend, is true grit. That's true grit. I've personally seen my mom tough it out through very difficult circumstances, criticism, devastating rejections, humiliated publicly by a man that promised one thing and did another, determined that she would provide for her children, teach them about Jesus' love, and to be forgiving. She was never disloyal with her words about the father of her children, but always forgiving. She always taught us kids forgiveness, love, grace, mercy. You want to talk about grit, my friend? I just happen to think that there are many moms that are superheroes. Why? Because of their talent? Because of their good looks? No, because of true grit. True grit won't quit. And it's not just true because it rhymes. It's just true. It's true. True grit is when you won't quit. You know what? Quit sin? Yes. But quit love? Never. Quit stupidity? I I, I sure hope so. For sure. That's what's called repentance. 
But quit believing, quit faithing, never, ever, ever. My mom didn't stop loving us even though she felt unloved. Can I say that again? My mom never stopped loving us kids even though she felt extremely unloved. That's grit. You know, sometimes the very thing that demands your grit uncovers your significance. House renovation TV shows are full of examples of designers crawling over each other, fighting with each other to find the old, imperfect, scarred wood, the vintage bricks, the worn, distressed, scarred up stones, right? It's called beauty meets grit. Think about the leaning tower of Pisa. It wasn't supposed to be leaning, but if it were straight, it probably wouldn't be much of a popular tourist attraction to this day. The attraction of the, tour, the Tower of Pisa is not based on its perfection, but rather its imperfection. The tower's persistence to stand, to endure, to remain, and yet be leaning is the reward of true grit. Just like a famous single mom who refused to give up, her name was Mary Kay. Mary Kay was divorced and was left with three children at a time in history when divorce was very socially unacceptable. You know, the, the good folks kind of looked down their nose at her. She married her second husband and they had planned a business together called Mary Kay Cosmetics. One month prior to the launch of their business, her husband died. Wow, talk about tragedy. Talk about difficulty. Talk about hardship. But with a $5,000 investment from her oldest son, Mary Kay launched her business. Did you know Forbes reported that their 2014 revenues were a little over $3.5 billion. Now, if you're using things like criticism, slander, scorn, mocking, lying, exaggeration, and just plain old ugly stubbornness, then you don't understand grit. True grit is virtuous. It's not devilish. It's beautiful. It's excellent. It's virtuous. It's pushing through. It, it manifests character. True grit is the manifestation of virtuous character, not giving up, getting back up even after you fall. If you're going the wrong way, doing the wrong thing and hitting the wall, you quit by repenting. But you don't quit life. You don't, you don't quit God. You don't quit you. You change your thinking. That's grit. Stubbornness says, I'm going to just keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. I think it was Albert Einstein that famously said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. The Bible even just calls that crazy thinking. You see, carnal stubbornness is just plain insanity. Stubbornness is an unwillingness to adjust. There's no such thing as virtuous stubbornness or saintly stubbornness. That's an oxymoron. It doesn't exist. It, stubbornness will ruin your life and all of your relationships. True grit has a flexibility to it. It's got a teachability to it because there's humility in the equation. Can you see that? If you substitute stubbornness for self-discipline, you'll find yourself at war with God. Stubbornness yields a harvest of, guess what? You got it. More stubbornness. If you sow stubbornness, you're going to reap a harvest of stubbornness. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as idolatry. You see, stubbornness is not a virtue, and stubbornness is not true grit. Stubbornness is saying, my way is above God's way. It's somebody saying, you know, I want my truth, not God's truth. That's stubbornness. My opinion is better than God's opinion or God's thoughts. My sacrifice is more than God's sacrifice. You know, this is popular in religion. This is popular in Christianity where people get up and they want to talk more about their sacrifice than what Jesus did at the cross. 
You know, if you have to be in ministry at the cost of your sacrifice and it's all about you, well, then you're doing the wrong thing. You need to find a new vocation. I mean, when you put it in that light, stubbornness is not just idolatry. I mean, it's stupid, right? Isn't it? It's stupid. Jeremiah eleven eight says this, but they didn't listen or pay attention. Everyone walked in the stubbornness of his own evil heart. And if you read on in that chapter, basically they end up walking into a bunch of curses and destruction because you see, that's the harvest on the seeds of stubbornness. It's not true grit. There are great rewards for having spiritual grit. We read in the beginning in part one that for, um, Second Peter chapter one tells us and encourages us to add to our faith the virtue of grit, the virtue of character, the virtue of that not letting go quality. Second Peter tells us and instructs us, add this to your faith so that your faith can see it through to the hope of your reward. There are great rewards for having spiritual grit. That Galatians 6, 9, won't let go, refuse to quit, doing good and nobly kind of grit. But there are also bad consequences to being stubborn. Bad consequences to being just plain stupid stubborn. And listen, I've done stupid stubborn. I know what it's like to get the rewards of being stupid stubborn. It hurts and it hurts you and it hurts others and it hurts your dream and it hurts those around you and it hurts your name, it hurts your influence. It's not worthwhile, let it go. It's just basically donkey behavior. Let your stubbornness go. There is an extreme difference between the virtue of true grit and the sin of stubbornness. True grit exemplifies the tenacity of trust, hope, faith, and humility all in one concert. It's orchestrated. That's true grit. Let me say it again. It's the tenacity of trust, hope, faith, and humility all in concert. But stubbornness is willful. It's disobedient. It's unfaithful. And it's defiance towards God's love. We heard that it's actually idolatry. It's making another God apart from the true God. How can stubbornness ever work for you? It can't. Let it go. So when do you apply true grit? I mean, after all, you don't want to waste your, your grit on a fool's errand, right? We talked about in part one, calculated and strategic true grit. It's got to be with wisdom. It's got to be applied properly. You know, I've seen organizations waste their resources, even their grit on an idea that's run its course. And now, even though it's antiquated, it's so familiar and it's so part of the culture that they waste their grit on futility. I've seen people waste their grit on relationships that Bible that the Bible would never condone. Then they say something religious sounding like, well, now, Pastor Stephen, I'm just trying to show them God's love. No, you're not. You don't realize it, but you've gone from grit to stubbornness. When your reasoning cuts contrary to God's word, the energy of grit is funneled into just plain rebellion stubbornness. You're engaged in futility. This moment right now, the Holy Spirit is trying to save you from, a, from ruining your destiny, from ruining your future. The decision is in your hands. You've got to pull back on the throttle right now. You've got to recalibrate your grit. Just because something requires grit does not mean it's worthy of investing grit. Always ask why before you ask how. Always. Always ask why before you get, get to the how. It's a basic rule of life because otherwise you end up putting everything into something that should be let go of, forsaken, dropped, or maybe just not pursued. You know, like your high school hairstyle. You got to just let it go. Don't hold on to it. That's not being gritty. It's just, it's, it's, as the comedian said, it's just sad. It's just, let, let it go. You, you can let it go. Come on. Ha have a friend next to you pray for you. Just let your high school hairdo, just let it go. 
You know, in Matthew 19, Jesus did not pursue after the rich young ruler when he walked away sad. The rich young ruler said to Jesus, look, I want to get eternal. How do I do this? How do I do it in my own strength, my own sacrifice? And Jesus is like, well, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Come follow me. The rich young ruler, he hung his head because what he was looking for was affirmation. See, he was looking for Jesus to affirm his lifestyle and his choices. He wasn't looking for truth. He was looking for affirmation. He wasn't looking for a savior. He thought he could save himself. And so Jesus was like, you want to pay your way, son? Then you sell everything you got. You give it to the poor and you come follow me. The Bible says Jesus loved the young ruler. He looked after him and he loved him. But Jesus didn't chase after him. For some reason, in religious circles, we redefine what the Word of God says and almost get this idea that Jesus chased after the young ruler. And says, hey, dude, that was kind of harsh. I, I shouldn't have said that. That was a little bit too much, wasn't it? And that somehow Jesus dumbed down the whole moment. But he didn't. In other words, listen, the rich young ruler disqualified himself from relationship with Jesus when the focus of his life was his money. The wrong why, so therefore there was no grit on Jesus' behalf applied in the focus of chasing after and discipling the young man. And we know Jesus has grit. I mean, Jesus went to the cross for you and me. Jesus actually applied grit to disciple Peter. That took grit. I mean, you're going to disciple a hard case. Peter was a tough case to disciple. Jesus had to apply grit to disciple our friend St. Peter, right? So there's a time to apply grit, but you've got to be calibrated. You've got to be calculated. You've got to be led by the Holy Spirit. Is this the right time? Jesus looked after the rich young ruler, loved him, but he did not chase after him, applying grit to that relationship to somehow try to get him to change his mind, to change his way of thinking, because that was on the young man's part. The young man had to pursue Jesus. That's the right order of things. It was that young man's responsibility for him to invest some grit in pursuing Jesus. I like what Peter Drucker said, a famous businessman, guru, who speaks to a lot of businesses and Fortune 500 companies, helping them get successful. And he said this, there is nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. There is nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. So why before how, right? You got to ask the why before you ask the how. There are many cans of worms that have been opened because someone didn't ask why before they asked how. You see, popular thinking is not good thinking. It's common to ask how, but not why. You can quickly complicate your life by not asking why before how. If the why of the 9-11 terrorists could have been caught without truly, if the why could have been caught, the how would have never been taught and so many lives would have been saved. Too many have stepped into marriage on the how without truly knowing the why. We get on this grit treadmill, insisting on making something work that God never sanctioned. I've seen churches do this. I've seen organizations do this. They try to keep a program alive that even God abandoned 15 years ago. Remember, Jesus cursed the fig tree. He didn't heal it. He cursed it because it was not working. James 4, verse 3. You ask... God for something and do not receive it because you ask with wrong motives. Your intention is when, when you get what you desire to spend it in sensual pleasures. Well, you and I know what would happen with that. You'd end up ruining your life. You'd end up destroying your life. God's saying you're asking, you may even be asking for the right thing, but you're asking with the wrong motives. James is saying that your why is all jacked up. Your motives are out of alignment. Motive is key to life. If you do the right thing for the wrong reasons, it's a heart issue. When the motive is corrupt, ultimately the effort will fail because it's corrupt at the root. I like this. Eugene G. Grace said this. Thousands of engineers can design bridges, calculate strains and stresses, and draw up 
specifications for machines. But the great engineer is the man who can tell whether the bridge or the machine should be built at all, where it should be built and when. So number one, tell me the why of your pursuit. Why taps your passion, motivates. It's about identity. It's about your true assignment. The why comes before number two when you dial in the specifics of your purpose. So number one, your why, but then number two, your purpose. Who is this going to benefit? Who is this going to help? Whose life is going to be improved? The mission of the assignment. And then number three, now it's persistence. You actually spend your grit here to increase your capacity for improvement, to tolerate the pain of growth, the rehearsal, the correction, the application. You see, if you get your persistence at number three, then you've already got lined up before you get to spending your wallet full of grit. And then number four, your faith. Whatever you're doing, it must be confirmed by your beliefs. Otherwise, you end up being at war with yourself. James even said this in James chapter four. He said, what are the, the reasons for wars on the inside of you? It's because you're at war with yourself. Faith taps hope. Your belief taps hope. If your faith is in God, then you actually can obligate the hand of God in your life. Then there's hope in your endeavor. So let's just say you're going to build a bridge and let's apply that. You want to build a bridge. So number one, why? Now, no, don't just jump to the purpose yet. See, this is a common mistake many people make. Why is deeper, far deeper than just the purpose. It's about your assignment. It's about the alignment of your character, your name, your identity with the assignment. You got to check your motives. Are you, are you chasing an identity in doing this? In building the bridge, is it about you trying to get an identity? Because if you're doing that, then you got the wrong motives. So you got to nail down the why. Are you being led? Are you being led by God in this endeavor? Right? What's the why? Then you go to the purpose. The purpose of building the bridge. Who's going to be helped by this bridge? See, the answer either attracts or repels others. Then number three, now we get into spending your true grit, the persistence. Do you have the capacity to see this effort through? Not, not just by talent, but by tenacity. I'm not saying do you have the talent to see it through, but do you have the tenacity to see it through? I like Luke 14 verse 28 says this, For which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? More than money, do you have the grit to do it? Do you have the source of grit to see this all the way through? And then number four with our bridge building, faith. If you're going to build this bridge and spend your grit on it, you must build it by faith. Translated, that means give me the scripture in God's word that tells me, that ties all of this together. See, I often ask couples about to get married and I say, show me in God's word what you're standing on as you pursue this covenant of marriage. I often ask business people who want me to pray with them. I say, you know, and they're launching into a new venture. I say, what is the truth of God's word that you're standing on as you go out and doing this? See, I'm, I'm asking, give me the absolute truth that you're building your belief and your faith in. Someone believing for a healing in their body. What is fueling your faith, sir? What are you standing on that gives you the confidence and the grit to believe, yes, by Jesus stripes, I'm healed? right? You got to have truth. Parenting. Talk about a true grit challenge, right parents? Parenting. I began with talking about my mom and her true grit. Let me finish with this. The word parenting is derived from the Latin word that means to bring forth. Really, it's like a discipleship term to bring forth out of your student, out of your disciple. Parents have the amazing task of bringing forth the potential, the purpose, the hope in their little disciples. How do you do that? Because, you know, it's not automatic. It's not a natural occurrence. You got to bring it forth. Well, let me point you to a story. Steve Young, the legendary quarterback of the San Francisco 49ers, had parents that taught him true grit. Now, I know very little bit, very little about sports and about football, but 
I'm amazed at this guy's story because his parents were so involved with helping to develop grit in Steve Young. Yes, grit can be taught. In fact, Steve's dad, his name is Grit, Grit Young. Can you imagine that? His dad's name is Grit. So he told him one time, Steve was discouraged. He was in college and he didn't feel like the coach was being fair. You know, the whole, dad, he's not being fair and he won't put me in this position. And dad, where, where's my turn? And, and Steve said he just wanted to quit. And he was kind of whining to his dad. And his dad said this to him. He said, you can quit, but you're not coming home. Because quitters don't live here at this house. Now, Steve's dad, I just want to clarify here. Steve's dad, grit, he had a history of always being there for Steve, always being supportive, always being faithful. I mean, he used to fly across the country just to be there for Steve's game. So he had this history built in, this equity built in to... Um, you know, supporting his son. So when he said what he said, it seemed like a hard thing, but he had the equity to say such a hard thing. He wasn't rejecting Steve, but he wasn't tolerating any quit coming up in Steve. Steve stayed at college. He didn't quit. Instead of quitting, he worked harder than anyone. He said he threw 10,000 spirals between the beginning of January and the end of February that season. He was the first to practice and the last to leave. He added persistence to purpose. You could say it this way, grit brought the grit out of his son. <laughs> Steve had the why, he had the purpose, he just needed the persistence called out of him. See, talent wasn't going to cut it. See, we know him as being this gifted, talented, amazing um, Hall of Fame quarterback in NFL football. But the truth is, both his family and Steve attribute his success to raw grit. Won't let go. Keep going. What's your big challenge right now? What's holding you down? Who's calling to your grit? When you put the why plus the purpose, plus persistence, plus faith, it equals unstoppable grit. Who's helping you with that? See, that's the kind of Jesus grit that helps you do what is otherwise impossible. I said this earlier, that the amazing gifts and talents and the, and the good things that God has put in you that is that are latent in your design need to be called up. They are under the overburden. The gold is under the overburden of what would seem otherwise as just worthless dirt. You've got to pull it up. You've got to dig down strategically to pull it up. Jesus worked this formula himself. The whole why, purpose, persistence, faith. He worked that same formula to accomplish his victory at the cross. Look at Hebrews 12 too. Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. Why? For you and me to redeem us. And now he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, Jesus had the why to the how. Talk about grit. Joseph had grit in the prison. Daniel had grit in the lion's den. Queen Esther had grit when, when a, 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 a horrific man wanted to annihilate the whole Jewish nation. Queen Esther had grit. True grit is the product of faith, believing, hoping, seeing beyond the impossibilities. Oh, we all need a grit hero in our life, a true savior, someone with overcoming tenacity that we can model after. Friend, it's time for you and me. It's time to come to Jesus. It's time for you to truly come to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who has conquered death, hell, and the grave for us. And you know why. We need a savior. We need the author and finisher of our faith. What's the point of having grit if you have nothing to apply it to? We need Jesus. We need Jesus. You can pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord Jesus, these are difficult times, but you are the great Savior. Your help is more than enough for me. So forgive me of all my sins. You died on the cross for me, conquered death and the grave for me, be the Lord of my life. Fill me with your spirit. 
Make me a child of God. Give me my life true purpose. In your name, Jesus. Amen.